What's up, y'all? This is Jesse Warden, and today I'm going to talk to you about state machines, specifically used in game development. Uh, they're also known as finite state machines. They're really just a, a design pattern or a series of design patterns that help maintain state as well as change of state. Um, so I'm going to show you three examples that I have in the code from GitHub, um, how they actually work, some of the challenges I had with them, as well as a fourth example of how I actually used it in uh, one of my games. So um, that's basically what I'm going to go over, and then you can check out the companion blog post and uh, the code's open source, blah, blah, blah. Um, so one of the things I wanted to show first is the actual um, article that this guy wrote. He... Uh, he has a very scientific article, so if you read it, it seems very eggheadish. Um, it is. He's 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 clearly very intelligent. But uh, I like these four statements that he wrote here that basically describe really what a state machine is, and it basically it, it defines behavior, uh, the behavior of action. So if, uh, one of the problems you have in games is you get a lot of behavior, and the class gets very big. <coughs> so for example, if you have a character jumping or moving. Um, a lot of that behavior tends to get very verbose, and also it has uh, relationships on how you know you can jump while you're walking. It gets a little complex, so states help break that out and separate it and make it a little more organized. Um, there's also transitions between the state, so when you go from like moving to jumping, or when you go from jumping to you know resting or whatever else, right? Finally, there's a lot of rules. Um, or maybe just one rule or conditions on when you can go from one state to another. So, for example, um, a state machine will keep track of the fact that you can only go from a, a, an idle state to resting versus you can't be running and then suddenly go to a resting state, right? You have to stop, relax for a few seconds, and then you can start resting, right? Um, and finally, the input events are, or, you know, as we know, like button presses and user events and, you know, getting hit by an enemy, blah, blah, blah. Those are the things that actually trigger uh, the state change, right? And uh, some of the charts here, too, are basically what the states are and what are the actual inputs or triggers, both internally in the state machine or externally. So very high level, but I recommend this article. It's only about uh, four pages, um, pretty short. He goes over two quick examples of how it's actually coded with state machines, in it, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, another um, article is the one written by, or is it, Richard Lord? He uh, did an AS3 one. Here it is, Finite State Machines for uh, Artificial Intelligence Act Script. He talks more about the actual artificial intelligence aspect of it where you assign it to the computer to run rather than reaction to a player or input events. And I, I read this article three times over the course of four years. I really liked it because it was simple. It made sense. And uh, I know AS3 is a little more verbose compared to Lua, but if um, it, overall the concepts are the same. Um, it's a really good example, so that's uh, one it is. So anyway, I've looked at all around. I found Troy. Troy Works has a really good uh, presentation, Troy Gardner, on uh, his state machines, um, and his is up on SVN as well. There was another guy. Um, what's uh, what's his nuts? He's a really um, Bill Sanders. Yeah, he he wrote a big set of um, state state design patterns in his book and talks about state machines. Um, also. Um, Jonathan Kay, who's actually done a lot of simulations, right? So what that means is you, you simulate certain events or patterns or machinery, and he actually does a lot of consulting on it. So he ha has a really unique and a different approach to states. Um, very, very deep and very broad. So if you're really looking to get swathed with info, this is another guy to check out some of his writings on it and his um, example code as well. Um, I mean, he runs an equipment simulations company, right? <laughs> so state machines run his business. So I thought, uh, if you read all these guys, it's uh, really interesting. But anyway, this this guy named uh, I can't pronounce his last name, Kaiso Kaiosuzen, or Casio Souza. Basically, he had a really simple AS3 state machine that I liked. So I took his code from GitHub. I mean, look at this like three classes, and you don't really need an event class in Lua, so it's two classes. So I ported that to Lua, and it's a really uh, good firm foundation. So that's what I ported a fort over here. And I'm going to go over the three examples that are actually included in the code. So let's open the Corona simulator and go directly to this uh, particular directory, which is example one. All right, so this first one is a plane game, okay? It's very similar to um, 1942 where you have a plane and it sh you know fires when you touch the actual phone screen. And it has uh, three modes of firing, okay? So let's look at the state machine of what defines this plane's firing modes, okay? So the three states are fire one, fire two, and fire three. Pretty simple, right? The actions that define transitions between the states are power-ups. So if your plane touches a power-up, 
you can actually go to a different state. In this case, go to firing two mode, where you have two bullets and it shoots faster. If you get another power up, you can actually go to fire three. However, you could get hit by an enemy or something else, and it could actually go back to fire one or fire two if you got hit twice. Right, so you can go to any state of fire one to fire three, or fire three to fire two, or whatever from any direction. Right, pretty simple state machine. Um, so I've, I've done two implementations I'd like to show you here. Uh, the first one is um, it's very similar to Tween Lights, um, basically parameterization how they do um, method calls, or similar to transitions in Lua. So for the Chrome SDK, um, they they do this a lot where they use tables for configuration for methods that have a significant amount of parameters. You just throw a table in there, and it, that way it doesn't matter what order it is. You can make some optional, blah, 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 right? So I followed the same standard. You always have to have, uh, when you create a state machine here, you always have to have the name of the state is the first thing, but anything after that is optional. I put from, you know, almost always, so you can say, look, you can go to the fire one state from any state, fire two from any state, and fire three. Okay, so there's two ways that you can handle when, is, when this state machine right here, this little Lua object, when it changes. You can, A, listen to a, an on-state machine changed event, which will fire this function. So anytime this state machine ever changed, you can react to it here. The second option is you can actually say, look, whenever I enter the fire one state, call this method. So this helps really, if you have a, a significant amount of states, this, this option helps really organize your code, help it grow better, okay? If you're just trying to get it done, play, or you're experimenting, trying to iterate quickly, this is fine as well. So I'm showing both options. Um, again, it's all magic strings, very loose typing. Um, the only thing that's actually a function reference is the actual function name. I don't support strings for now. And finally, uh, when you create a state machine and you define the states that you can basically input into it, um, you also have to say, what's the initial state? Or what state do I start in, right? So here, I st automatically start in the fire one, right? In this case, uh, when I touch these buttons right over here, fire one, fire two, it's actually going to change the state, right? So I'll show you. Fire one button is right here. Fire two is right here. And fire three is right here. It'll change the state to fire one when I click this. It'll change the state to fire two. And notice there's no rules checking. I can go from any state to any state. But this simulates if I were to fly around and catch a power up, right? So we'll click fire two. It'll change the state to fire two. And it starts firing two bullets and it fires them faster, right? If I click three, it fires three bullets and it fires really fast, right? So this changes the state. Same plane, same behavior of moving and flying, but the actual firing mechanism changes. So how does it do that? Well, the state machine changes, right? Whenever I say change the fire state to two. Okay, whoop de doo Well, let's look at how it reacts. So I'm going to go to the on change player fire function. You'll notice if uh, the state name I snag from the event, or snag directly from the state machine itself, whatever you want to do, it's either option. If I am in fire one, it'll tell the player to use the fire one function to actually fire the bullets. The fire speed is how fast or how many milliseconds the game loop um, fires a new shot, right? So the, the fire three state is significantly fast, whereas the fire one is not as fast, it's one third of a second, okay? And it sets those constants on the entity or the player. So state machines usually manage the behavior that the entity does, but the entity, ac entity actually stores the variables in the state. So state's kind of a bad word. It actually stores the variables or the values or the data. The states themselves, in this case fire one, is really just a string with behavior. It doesn't actually store anything. It just says, look, if I'm fire one, you need to do you know this. So let's say an another way to look at it. Instead of a gigantic switch statement, let's look at what ha happens when um, we use the, the actual inner methods instead. So if I click it and I enter fire one, it says, okay, make the player use the fire one firing and then make the fire time one third of a second. If I click two, it'll say, all right, use the fire two mechanism and make it a little bit faster, right? So this is a little easier to read. It just requires more functions, right? It's not all, you know, in one nice little place, a little more optimized. Now you have, you know, more functions, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, whatever you feel more comfortable with is, is you know, it's fine, okay? So what, it, what do these implementations really mean? Well, this goes back to, even though this is the behavior, I've got the actual way in which the entity fires inside the entity, AKA the player. So let's take a look. The player, inside of uh, fire one, when I define it down here as a simple closure, player one, fire one, just takes, creates a bullet and says, all right, go in this direction. Fire two, gets a bullet and says, all right, it's a bigger bullet, right? It's the, the sprite, uh, I'm sorry, the image that has two bullets on it, and it centers it into the center of the plane, so it's a bigger sprite or bigger image. Fire three gets three of them, 
right? It sets these two off on different directions, one to the left and one to the right, right? And they both uh, use the tick method, which is a game loop, right? It's a more efficient way of drawing. You could use inner frame, whatever. Bottom line is each bullet goes uh, its own direction, and this one is just normal and goes straight, right? So these three functions assume they're the only ones being run, right? The actual fire mechanism when you fire is on player firing. If the player is, in fact, firing, right, in his tick method, he'll say, okay, if it's time to fire, call the fire method, right? Now, where's the fire method? Well, it's a dynamic method set by these guys, right? See, player one defaults to fire two. So anytime you change the state, it's going to change it to the fire one, fire two, or fire three, right? It's just a simple function reference. It's really all it is. Now, you could use Booleans and everything else, but this is a lot more scalable. So, this is a pretty simple example. So, if I click one, it changes it to fire one, where it shoots a bullet. Fire two, it points to the second function a little bit faster. Fire three, points to the third function and makes the firing a little bit quicker, right? That's really it. So, the actual entity, or in this case, the plane, this function right here, which is called get player, it creates a sprite sheet, gets an image, adds all those variables. It says, all right, here's your tick method. If you fire, go ahead and do so. Fly to the point I clicked on, blah, blah, blah. And here's his actual actions for doing it, right? So let's look at what happens when, that's a pretty simple state machine, right? It's pretty linear. So one of the powers of state machines and finite state machines, especially the classes that are wrapping them, are what happens when you have a hierarchical one. What that means is, is that states actually have parents and children. So let's take a look at example two. And I'll show you the uh, flow chart real quick. So the second example is based on a hierarchical state machine where the entity is a robot of war. And it has a variety of different modes that it can go into, each with its pro and cons. Scout mode is basically you can walk, you can walk reasonably fast, but it has very good mobility. I haven't added jumping, but the point is, is that scout mode, it looks like a human, has a lot of sensors, you know, opened up. It uh, doesn't really have very high defense, but its goal is to do reconnaissance, right? So if uh, what are the actions? If you want to touch um, the, the right arrow key, it'll scout right, start walking. If you release it, or you know whether you click on a desktop or on a phone you actually touch, it'll go back to the scout mode. Okay, So the scout mode, the defend mode, and the assault mode are the three main parent states. Scout has two children. It has a, a scout right and a scout left. The only way to go to scout left and scout right is from the scout state. You cannot go there from defend, and you cannot go there from assault. Right? See how that works? So scout uh, state um, can also go to the defense state, but you you can also go from scout to the assault state. Okay, so that's what these arrows mean: is that you can go there by touching defend or touching whatever. Um, I can also touch assault. I know it's not shown here, but you get the point. So uh, same with left. If I touch left, it'll go left. Whatever else, defend. Um, regardless of whether you're in assault or scout state, you touch it. It it has a, a a little trick that state machines do, and that is whatever state I was previously in, just go back to it. Right? So if you're in Scout and you press the Defend button, he'll raise his shields, and then if you let go of the Defend button, he'll go back to either Scout or Assault, wherever he came from. Now Assault's very complicated, and this is the whole point of doing parent-child relationships, is that Assault has a very common functionality. You're a little more defensive, you have a little higher speed, um, but you can't really fire. You have to actually enter firing mode. So Assault Right and Assault Left is just your tank, you move very similar to Scout Left and Scout Right, but you move a little bit faster. The three firing modes are sight, we do a laser sight to call down satellite strikes, a sniper mode where you can shoot uh, really thin bullets, and artillery where you can actually shoot uh, large uh, ordnance to affect larger areas. Not as precise and not as stealthy, but get, gets the job done. All three of these modes, you'll notice, have no way to move. The only thing sight can do is do a laser sight. A sniper can only fire a gun, and artillery, artillery can only fire tank rounds. Okay, if as soon as you let go or, or click the attack mode to go back, you'll go back to assault mode, right? So it's not really release sight; it's more of click attack or click assault, click assault, click assault, right? You don't release. It's actually a, 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 a child state. So that's the only way to get back. Is from sight, sniper, and artillery to go back to assault. Once you're in assault mode, then you can go back to defend or scout. You can't go from sight to scouting or, or sight to defend. The the robot actually has to transform back to assault mode, then back to defend mode. Right? And these are what's called paths. So these little lines show these paths. So again, the white ones, all these boxes are states, and these yellows are all the actions to or rules to transition between states. Okay? So let's show you actually what the 
the example two does. So you have a robot who's in scout mode. You hit left, he goes to scout left. As soon as I let go, he's back in scout mode. I have the printout still left there, as you can see. If I click right, he goes back to right mode. And there you go, right? Now, at any point, I can let go and hit defend, and he'll go to defend mode. Notice I c the only way to get out of it is to let go. So I have the buttons on the bottom here also reacting to the state machine as well. Now you'll notice these two bars up here that actually listen to the property changes on the entity. Well, each state has different behavior. So for example, when I defend, I can't really move at all. I'm holding up a bunch of shields, so if any bullets strike me, I can't get hurt. So I, I notice the speed goes to zero. However, my defense goes as high as possible. As soon as I let go, I'm no longer defending. I'm in scout mode. I'm very, you know, exposed, and so my defense goes really low. My speed's reasonably high again. I can actually move, right? So let's go to attack mode. Now, attack mode, I can move a little bit faster, and my defense is a little bit about the same lowered, right? But I can go left or right, and a little bit faster as well. So you can see assault left, assault right. Those are the states that I'm in, okay? Now, you'll notice these three child modes that I can now go into. I can go into sight. I can do a laser sight, right? Call down satellite strikes. Notice the speed's gone again. I can't, I can't go anywhere. The, I can go back to the assault state. Notice, just like the flowchart says here, right over here, I can go back to the assault state by clicking attack, right? He'll go back. So we went from sight to assault. Um, the sniper mode, he has a little gun. He can shoot things, right? Go back, left, right. Right, and then go back to sniper. So he can shoot. And finally, there's artillery. So I went from sniper to assault. Go from assault to artillery. Following the flowchart here. Boom. Boom. See how that works? Now I can't move. I can only go back to the assault state. And back to where we go, right? So this is the advantage of doing a... Um, a hierarchical because there's a lot of child state and sub states and rules that if I'm in one of these three child states there's no way that I can go back to the scouting or the defense state right so hierarchical states help organize that and help keep the rules for that so if I were to be in scout state and I tried to click on a site button by accident the state machine would say hey you can't do that right so it helps find these bugs early in the cycle rather than later and also helps you when you're trying to do transitions between the states with the uh, sprite sheets so let's take a look at the code and how that actually works so the syntax, for example, two on main is very similar to the other one, except this one has a lot more child parameters. So let's expand Sublime here so you can see them. So the scout, you can go uh, to the scout state from defend or assault, either one, doesn't matter, right? When it enters the scout state, I need to enter the scout state. Right? This is just to say, hey, I need to show the c correct sprite sheet. The scout left and the scout right both define their parent as the scout state. Right. This does a couple things. Number one, it ensures that no one else can go there unless they go to scout first. Second, unless assuming the scout's left the parent. Secondly, it ensures that scout left and scout right are implied to be able to go there from from. So you don't actually have to add from you know scout here. If it's a par it's a parent, it'll automatically handle that for you. And uh, when I enter and exit, I want it to call these states. So initialize and then exit. So this helps set things up, make sprite sheets uh, play or rewind them if you want to go backwards, right, from the artillery and whatever else, how it played in reverse. I'll show you again if you don't remember. So I go to right and I say artillery. He sets up as a tank. I then go back. He plays in reverse, right? That's what these initialization states allow me to do rather than have this huge, gigantic switch statement. Um, which, if you want to see what a huge, gigantic switch statement looks like, just simply look at the warbot, the actual robot that it's handling, and look at how it handles changing sprite sheets. Right? This is what's known as a nasty, uh, you know, gigantic switch statement for uh, sprite sheets. Right? <laughs> and then positioning. I could have used a state machine and made this a lot cleaner. Right? So this is an example where you can use state machines not just for, you know, game entities' behavior, but simply just animations. Right? It's a different state or a different whatever. Um, but again, this is supposed to be simple, so you can say, all right, well, I just want to do one thing. All right, so that's Scout. Defend is pretty simple. It has no children, right? Just like in the flowchart, no children. Just defend. And it can you can go there from Scout or Assault. And when you're done, it'll go back to wherever it came from. Notice uh, he can go to Scout or Assault, and when you enter an end, he'll go there. Assault is a little more complicated. Uh, it has Assault left and right to actually move, and then it has... So these are actually two parent or t children of assault and sniper 
in sight and artillery are also children of artillery. Notice you can't go from assault left or right into one of these three. You have to go back to assault, then these. So you can't be moving and then all of a sudden, you know, do a sniper. Now we could probably do that, but that would require your artist to have um, some animation of when the, they're moving left and then they, you know, stop, deploy their uh, robot arms to s make things nice and smooth, and then they go to sight, right? So I have all the from here as well. It's implied that any of these can go from assault. And finally, enter and exit. So what does all these enter and exits really do? Well, they make it really simple. And notice here he starts inside of the uh, scout state, okay? It makes it really simple to define the behavior. Now, if you look over here, you can see how it's pretty standard and pretty repetitive, which is good. It means it's really easy to read. So enter scout state. Set this, the uh, sprite sheet to the scout. So that's why you see that little little scout animation right there that looks like a robot and he walks like a, a human being it sets his speed to four so when he's in this state I want his, him to be slower and, and look like a, the stand up person when, he, when I enter the scout left state I want him to start walking left and turn him left and then start moving or start playing the animation when I leave go back to the scout sprite sheet and stop moving, right? So let's go left, he'll start showing the animation. As soon as I let go, it exits the scout state, stops moving, right? And he stays the regular scout sprite sheet. So this translates. Now, I could change the implementation internally and this could stay the same, which is kind of nice. Same exact thing for the right. When I enter, do this. When I exit, do this, okay? Pretty simple stuff. Defense is same thing. When I enter to the defense state, show the defend animation. Show the defense to 10, set my speed to 0. When I exit, set my defense back to 1. Don't really care what your speed is because at that point, I have no idea where you're going. So it's not up to me to define what your speed is. I just know when you come into me, you're slow, period. But when you go out, you can be whatever you want. Assault state has some high-level defaults, right? For example, speed is 8 when you're assault. <coughs> if any of their children states say you can't move, great. So when you enter your assault state, that's, that's what you're going to look like. Now, when I go left, set my direction to the left. Sorry, one time. And um, I'll have the wheels internally move, right? The start moving just says, look, if I'm moving, I don't care what state I'm in, show the proper animation. So I allow the internal entity to manage how that looks. I'm just telling him what his behavior should be, right? Uh, when I exit the assault left state, stop moving. The exact same thing for right. Make sense? Sight state is that animation where... I, I have my little arm, my laser beam, and I can look around. He starts tracking this, the sight. So you, when you move your mouse around, it knows to track and draw the laser beam to wherever you're pointing, right? And then when you let go, it stops tracking and sets your speed back to something fast, right? Because you're no, they, know, they know you're going to the assault state. Now, I could take this out and put this on the inner assault state, but here's the problem. When you enter the assault state, right, and then you go to the sight state, you do not get an exit assault state. And the reason why is that you are in the assault state. Even though it's your parent, you didn't technically leave. So if you're in sight, sniper, or artillery, you're still technically in the assault state. It just so happens to be a child, right? So those methods don't move. So you still have some initialization for both entering and exiting that you got to keep in mind. It's, um, it's just a common, common accident people forget about. That's why I always set the speed both in and out. <coughs> All right, so that's uh, that. And artillery is the last one. We have artillery, and then artillery reverse just plays the animation reverse, right? That's it. I have some events that I handle externally. So, like, when you click, it actually shakes. Whenever a bullet hits, it shakes the screen. So, for example, if I say attack and artillery, see how the screen shakes? This just listens for whenever the artillery bullets fire. So, I could have put this elsewhere, but I wanted the screen to shake when I did it. So... It doesn't matter what state it's in. This, this doesn't care. It just cares about this event, which is nice. It keeps the code clean. It doesn't have to say, if I'm in this state and a bullet was fired, then, you know, it says, look, this event will only fire when actually artillery, artillery bullets are firing and hitting the walls, right? Pretty cool. All right. So that is basically um, the entity and state machine relationship. But there's one more thing I wanted to show you, and that is this buttons controller. You'll notice that these buttons can react to state changes, right? Right. They make it a little simpler than like, all right, uh, so I don't want to click the scout state if I'm in snipe state. Like, it's just not even available, right? It's smart. So the actual behavior or respect of the rules of where you can go is handled internally inside the buttons controller, right? And it's called controller 
It just so happens because controllers respond to user gestures and update the model, blah, 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 just like MVC, right? Very clever. So what is buttons controller? Well, it makes all these buttons, right? And then he hides them all. So anytime you click on um, one, it'll, it'll dispatch a normal event, right? It'll dispatch on move left, on move right. And if you look at the very bottom, it says, cool, tell the state machine to go here. If I click on it, if I let go, go to end, right? Pretty simple code, right? However, how does it know? Well, here's the brains. It listens for the on state machine change event. Whenever it changes, it says, if I'm in this set of states, show these buttons. In this state, show these buttons, right? So it makes it a little easier for you to not have to worry about bugs. And the cool thing is if you, get, if you screw this up, you don't have to worry about it because the rules that you defined in the very beginning of only from this and only from this will be enforced at runtime. So if you screw this up and show a button that they're not supposed to be, don't worry about it. You'll get an error right here. It'll tell you, hey, dude, you can't do that. You know what I'm saying? Hey, a bug. Fantastic. I, I don't have bugs in my code. So that is example two, and it shows an example of a hierarchical state machine. So you'll notice uh, the way you can have a single state machine, right, the bot finite state machine that uh, can react and control the actual entity, which in this case is the war bot, all the variables. However, others can look at the state as well, right, and react to it because it's an event-based system. Now notice it's not using runtime. Um, if you actually look at the state machine class itself, I did give you the option to display, uh, I extend group, display.group instead of a normal Lua table. So if you would like, instead of, where's dispatch? Instead of this, you could change to runtime if you want. Use the global event bus that comes to Corona. It's up to you, don't really care either way. I just like normal, you know, entity level or table level events, but that's, you know, my thing. So that's basically this example. So let's take a look at example three. Example three, is pretty simple as well. It is a simple character that moves left, moves right, jumps left, jumps right, attacks, and has a ready state. If he doesn't do anything for three seconds, he rests. Right? Pretty straightforward. So let's take a look at that one. Go to Charisrona. My Sharona. Open. All right, so here's example three. You can run right. You can run left, you can jump right, and you can jump left. And notice how he's breathing, right? Watch what happens if he sits still. He'll go to the resting state and play slower. If he moves, he's ready, he's going, he's going. And after three seconds, he slows down, right? Pretty simple state machine. However, what's special about this state machine? What's special about this one is that instead of using the tween light syntax, or any hierarchical states, it uses classes. Let's show you what classes are. At least M Jesse Warden's interpretation of ideas he stole from Douglas Crockford and others in the community, such as Darren and Jonathan Beebe and all those other famous people. Let's see, main. So <clears throat> here's the player. Here's the buttons controller. And here's the game loop. No state machine. <laughs> Where is it? It's inside the player. So the player, a.k.a. the entity that the state machine manages, also has inside his own state machine, right here. He instantiates the state machine inside himself, passes himself in as the entity. Notice none of the others utilize this optional constructor parameter, but this one did. He said, hey, I'm the entity you want to act upon. So the state machine will now have a reference to it, and all states within it will also have a reference to the entity that you passed in within it, right? I then say, hey player, here is your state machine. Now this is important. The state machine has a reference to the entity, and the entity has a reference to the state machine. And I'll get in, into why this is important. Again, going back to the article, input events which are either externally or internally generated, which means that maybe a player who just so happens to be managing the box 2D collisions is aware of something that the states are not, right? Or the states internally, such as ready state, said, hey, dude, you haven't touched anything for three seconds. I'm going to go to the resting state, right? So this gives you the option to do the external ones a lot easier. Notice, too, the game loop 
adds both the player and the state machine. That's right, the state machine has a tick method as well. So it too can respond to a game loop and be device timer independent. All right, so last thing, add state two, very Visual Basic-esque, that's right, instead of making a nice add state class method, I just used a two, because I'm ghetto fabulous. So what we do is we create states as classes. So we say ready state new, resting state new, and we say the initial state is ready. Now how come I didn't use a static method? Don't know, I just like the feeling of using strings. So it keeps the method, the methods uh, and the class usage about the same, the API is about the same. The only difference is this add state, you actually use a class, right? Since you only do this once, I didn't really feel like making this also change as well. It's pretty easy in Lua to support method overloads or optional parameter types since everything's a variant anyway, but I don't know, I just I did this. So the convention I follow is notice ready, ready state, resting state, moving right state. Everything ends in a state. So my assumption is the convention is this will be ready, this will be lowercase resting, this will be camel case moving right, moving left, right, and you can pass those in there, right, as a string. So that's my um, methodology or convention, and I'll show you internally. So let's look at what do these state classes actually do. So we'll open ready state. So they all extend base state, which is the second class that I ported from Kai, uh, Kaizen's, uh, Sousa's, um, Casio Sousa's state machine. They extend this base state class and pass in a name. For this case, since it's ready state, I follow the convention of ready. You can put whatever you want in there, but I put ready, okay? Now states themselves aren't really supposed to have state, but you'll notice I have some variables up here that are initialized and destroyed in the exit. So every state has an enter and exit state, very similar to the enter and exit methods. These are always called guaranteed before you actually exit a state. And these are always called after you've exited another state. So you can always depend on these things being called in the correct order. And the cool thing is you have an access to your entity, assuming you have an entity. Some state machines don't. <coughs> so this allows you to get a reference to the player that you are managing. So I can call his names, whatever else. You'll notice here though, instead of doing um, specific listener handles for the buttons controller, I'm saying, look, somewhere a buttons controller is going to dispatch a global event and I will hear it on the event bus, right? You could use something other than runtime. You could maybe make another state machine for your buttons controller. It's really up to you, but I just, I'm giving you an example here. I like this for a couple of reasons. Number one is this state for ready only manages one thing alone. That is, I'm doing nothing other than if I rest, change my state to the resting state. So the event is generated internally, right? Internally, I change my state to resting at the next tick. The reason I do next tick instead of just change state is that this allows all this code to finish in this particular stack, right? Let's say I, I fire 50 other methods. It won't actually physically change the state, uh, this, yeah, change the state until all this code in the stack is run and that the next tick update will actually run. It's very similar to inner frame and flash or, um, I don't know, request animation frame in some of the browsers, blah, blah, blah. The point is, is that you get rid of all kinds of strange race conditions. You say, look, complete all the code I've got going on. As soon as you're ready, change me to the rest, the resting state when you're ready to go, right? So this guarantees that all your code is complete and you don't get some strange stuff. Because you could actually be in like two states because this is on stack, right? All right. So it calls reset and says, all right, whenever I come into the state, reset and tell me how long it takes until I go to the resting state. Now, here's the key. Most state machines will guarantee that you cannot respond or go to other states, right? Um, and I used, as you saw in the example two, I used a button controller to say, hey, if I'm in this button controller, let me show you that one more time, just refresh your memory. The buttons controller said, only show those buttons based on this particular state, right? So this switch statement handles that. Here, I've taken a chunk of it and just put it right here and say, look, I'm in re ready state based on my flow chart. If I'm in the ready state, I can go to any of these five states, right? So I listen for any of those five potential state changes. Move left, move right, attack, jump left, whatever. If any of these fire from anywhere, don't care if it's a button press or some other event, don't really care. I'm going to respond and say, okay, at the next takes move left or move right, right? So this allows the state to actually change internally. Notice this right here. Every state class has a reference to the state machine that created it. 
So you can say self.stateMachine and then call the methods on it. So this also allows the states themselves, the state classes, to have a reference to the state machine and affect it. I know I glazed over it here, but now you're starting to see how all state classes do it. Now here's the thing. When I talked about focus, let's actually go to the moving left state and you can see what he handles. He handles setting the direction to the left and showing the sprite to move. The details are handed in the base class. <gasps> Inheritance? What? Super class? Super methods? What? Right. See how tight and clean this is? This is one particular class that can scale really well. This is why I like the classes model. And notice the moving left state can only do one thing. And that is, if you're moving, you have to release the left button to get out of the moving state and go back to ready. That is it. That is all this class can do. Therefore, it's a really small class, right? R nothing wrong with small code that's repetitive and easy to read, it, as long as it's dry, okay? <coughs> dry is where the base class comes in. So let's take a look at the class that it extends. Moving state does a couple things, okay? It listens to if you stopped moving, if you attacked, or whatever else. Now, technically, you can't really um, attack or jump while you're in a moving state, but I'll get to that in a minute. So if you uh, the game loop fires, it'll handle actually moving, whether it's left or right. It doesn't care which direction. It says whatever, whatever direction we are, handle that, and do the distance formula and move based on how much time I've actually done, right? So it's nice and smooth between platforms. However, it doesn't know what direction it is, right? It, that's up to the subclasses, so move left and move right. So I can put all the logic or behavior for actually moving the, the, the entity itself read his variables, right, on his constants on how to move, but the actual implementation details are here. So all this code is no longer in the entity, right? It makes it nice and sweet. So if you look at that, he's just got a bunch of low-level details for sprite sheets, for variables, set up, you know, Corona uh, sprite sheets, blah, blah, blah. And that's it. There is no logic in here or behavior. It's just all in the states, which means the bigger and more complex he gets, the more state classes I get, rather than a bloated class, which is really nice. Now, in, in considering Lua's, you know, a tight language, 140 lines of code is still a lot, at least for Lua. Um, so that's ready state. That's the base class and moving state, which helps encapsulate. So even though I have state classes, they can still be dry and have inheritance, right, and actually share implementations. The right does the exact same thing. He extends moving state with a moving right name, but all his implementation details are still in the base class, so I don't have to repeat code. All right, so that is basically it for example three. You can see a class-based uh, state system rather than using that. I have the option of triggering those events from the state classes themselves. For example, ready can actually initiate a state change uh, through time timer for his game tick. They all share the same game loop. Um, the uh, They can also respond to global events and respond to changes and actually change the state on the state machine themselves. They have full access to the entity within the classes. And they support inheritance, so they can actually keep things a little bit more dry. As your code grows, you can create uh, a lot of more easily read classes and organize them into Corona's package structure. So it's all nice and organized. And um, yeah, that's that's basically it, I think. Let me see if there's anything else I wanted to show you. Um, no, that's really about it. So yeah, I, I think the only different thing about this particular buttons controller is that he just handles the actual callbacks themselves. He has no logic on which ones to actually show, just because this is a standard, you know, entity that moves. So yeah, that's about it. Um, so to show you the, I guess the other one, um, the the ones where I've had some edge cases on my actual real implementation of this in a game. So this game I'm creating called Zombie Stick. It's a very similar to, uh, you know, a two D side scroller, and um, one of the challenges I've had is there's three edge cases for the um, actual states that I wanted to talk about. So the first thing you'll notice is that they have all the same standardized states, but let me show you something here. Let me go into the base player, which is in JSO. All right, so you can so notice I have a lot more states here. I have, like, a fire hose when he jumps off. Um, <clears throat> I can do martial arts when a zombie tries to grab me. All kinds of cool things, right? Um, that's basically it, right? Still standard affair. However, I have a lot more state information in this guy um, when something grapples me and whatever else, and I'll show you that in a second. So let's go to base player. 
this is this is really some of the challenges I've had with this. Um, you notice he I actually forward the tick on rather than share the actual game loop because so that's one way of reducing the encapsula or increasing encapsulation. So here's an example: when a zombie or anything tries to grab me, I actually get the current state and verify it's legal. So you'll notice I'm actually doing these rules outside of the state machine in the classes. So this is one challenge I've had where um, you know, if an uh, entity tries to do a normal grapple technique and uh, the collisions are all handled internally by the entity itself, because, you know, it's a low-level detail, it still has to be aware of the state machine to make sure it doesn't do some illegal things, right, and, and cause some errors so I can quickly identify if that happens. Um, otherwise, you know, the zombies are allowed to grab me and I can get off them and stuff like that. Another thing, notice inside the entity, he also changes the state, right, based on internal variables that happen. So rather than just doing normal dispatch events, right, whether it's through the runtime or whether it's a self.dispatch, which I have a few up here, I think, that do a self-dispatch, yeah, like uh, change events for the speed and things like that, which is right up, yeah, so like, for example, if I performed an action, whatever else, I, I detract from my stamina. So the states can listen to this. They can also listen to the global runtime events as well, right, for the event bus to the whole system. So GUI, GUI stuff will actually respond to this as well, not just the state machine. But see, here's the challenge, is that sometimes the entity does need to be aware of the state machine so he can affect change, right? So that's one option why I've liked the state machine, but it's also a challenge in that you, you know, have to be careful. You have to map out what states you can do, and if not, you know, put a lot of logs and errors around just in case uh, you get into some strange situation. So that's one. The other one was, I believe, let me see if I can remember where it was. I had the state itself... It might have been in the grapple state. Let's go check that out. Um, yeah, so he actually did some physics uh, joints and actually created some physical things inside of it, which was, you know, it's okay, but he has to keep a reference to it and make sure he cleans it up after him. So even though states are supposed to be stateless, as in they don't exist for long periods of time and keep it, and it's supposed to be on the entity, um, I have some nasty code where I sometimes actually attach it to the state when I'm trying to play around or you know, figure out what the best place for this code is. So that's that's one problem I've run into, is that I just have a lot of this code left over that I haven't had time to fix. Um, so that's one. Let's look at the grapple defense. Um, ah, you know, another one. The zombie himself actually has uh, some of his states that I copied off of Richard Lord's ideas, where um, if he's hit, right, the zombie, when, when he's hit by something, whether it's a bullet or something else, he can... He can actually go to an injured state. Um, when he tries to grab the player, it's assumed that within internally he knows uh, what player he hit, right? So uh, there's a lot of... It's encapsulated, but a lot of the behavior is dependent on entity-type data, which is pretty good, and this is, this is what you want. It's just uh, been tricky in my mind to really remember you know, where the line between entity data and behavior really ends because sometimes there's some dependencies that just cannot work without each other. Also, keep in mind, this particular state is dependent on the player state machine. So, for example, when the zombie grabs the player, he, the zombie goes into the grab player state, the player has a chance to defend himself. And if you look at the ready state on grapple target touch, that means that I touched the zombie and I have a chance to get away. So if you look at the grapple state, this is in reaction to another state machine affecting me, right? It's all through the global event bus, so it's legit, you know, it's cool. But after a while, this kind of gets out of control. So if you don't have, you know, these, these charts that basically document every single possible state machine and state machine interactions between each other, this can get a little unmanageable. So that's one of the challenges I've also been running into. Um, so to show you an example of what that looks like, I'll open up the zombie stick show you what happens um, when I go to the main. Alright, so as you can see, as I run around, the entity manages all the data of the stamina to go down, and it'll uh, renew it as well. Right? If I sit still, it'll go to the resting state. So here's what happens. If I hit a zombie, that entity will do the bo normal box 2D collisions internally and dispatch an event. His state machine listens for that. If it says, hey, you touched a player, go ahead and on that particular entity or player, call his add grapple method. My player will listen for those events. If somebody tries to grab me, my state is immediately changed, right? And it knows to go to the grapple state. So all my controls are disabled, and I have to react to that so I can do martial arts. Now, originally, my idea is this will be time. You only have a, a few seconds to actually ungrapple yourself from a zombie, but for now, it's just testing. So I'm going to get away, 
successfully anti-grapple away and it knocks him down. The zombie hears that event dispatched and goes to his prone state and he'll try again. All right? Now I can do an attack state which is the normal box TD collisions and he'll get to a temporarily pro, uh, injured state which means he sits there for a second. Right? So I'll show you a more advanced version of that is that if I grapple him twice and then attack while he's in that state the attack is aware that he's in that state. So watch what happens when I, I do an attack and he's in the temporally prone state. Blood out! Right? So that's how it works. Some of the code for that. If uh, I go to the zombies, um, let's look at the package structure and I'll show you. And this again is where state machines talk to state machines. So not only do you map the state machines out in flowcharts, but you should also map their interactions as well. And there's another blog post I'll show you for that. So if you look in the um, temporally injured, if I hit him, He'll stay there for about whatever the timeout is. I think the timeout's like two or three seconds, right? I have it up here. Now, again, this is bad practice. <laughs> it should be on the entity. I'm just still trying to figure it out. So I, I basically write it here, and when I'm ready to do it right, I feel good about the code, I refactor it and put it inside the entity, right? So this is my refactoring path. Um, if he gets knocked prone by, let's say, I knock him down, he'll sit there for about five seconds. And uh, if he does get hit, zombie hit it'll reset the timer right so he'll, he can constantly stay down here if you beat him down so again my name is uh, Jesse Warden you can read more on my blog about corona and state machines and whatnot um, I also you can follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash jester XL and where I talk about various things uh, you can also follow me on Google Plus my name is Jesse Warden and uh, I look like that. I actually have two accounts, so just be aware. It's got to be the uh, hipster-looking Brooklyn Node.js using mofo, not the dude with the stogie in his mouth. And uh, a lot of these blog posts I'll put in the article and um, post some other blog posts that are really valuable. So again, I hope that was uh, valuable. You understand uh, state machines, how they can work, how they can interact with other state machines, how they can manage... Uh, state and really organize your code and reaction and the basically all the behavior code that your entities need to deal with and um, You know how the three ways that you can do it uh, you can do a normal You know set of strings in the between light syntax you can do hierarchical and you also can do class based whichever ones you want um, And again a lot of these concepts are applicable to you know other things in Corona. It's unity. It's action script You know any any type of that you can also do it in application development for simulations and for situations and uh, managing time-based si si situations, etc. So I hope that was uh, helpful and valuable. And if you got any feedback, I'd love to hear it. Um, again, the code is on GitHub. So if you want to make some contributions or corrections, <laughs> that's great. Uh, Zombie6, uh, the code is here for Zombie6. So you can see the implementation of it. Um, also, the actual, uh, if I go to the repo, um, if you go to the Lua Corona SDK State Machine, link which is also on YouTube all the code is there with the examples so if you, it's got unit tests as well I'm still adding so if you open your Corona SDK um, to one of the th you know three folders example one or whatever it'll pick up the main and you can test it out um, and that is basically it thank you very much for your time